Coffin Road proudly presents The Romance of Certain Old Clothes by Henry James Read by Ryan Marshall Towards the middle of the 18th century, there lived in the province of Massachusetts a widowed gentlewoman, the mother of three children, by name Mrs. Veronica Wingrave. She had lost her husband early in life and had devoted herself to the care of her progeny. These young persons grew up in a manner to reward her tenderness and to gratify her highest hopes. The firstborn was a son, whom she had called Bernard in remembrance of his father. The others were daughters, born at an interval of three years apart. Good looks were traditional in the family, and this youthful trio were not likely to allow the tradition to perish. The boy was of that fair and ruddy complexion and that athletic structure which in those days, as in these, were the sign of good English descent, a frank, affectionate young fellow, a deferential son, a patronizing brother, a steadfast friend. Clever, however, he was not. The wit of the family had been apportioned chiefly to his sisters. The late Mr. William Wingrave had been a great reader of Shakespeare, at a time when this pursuit implied more freedom of thought than at the present day, and in a community where it required much courage to patronize the drama even in the closet and he had wished to call attention to his admiration of the great poet by calling his daughters out of his favorite plays. Upon the elder he had bestowed the romantic name of Rosalind, and the younger he had called Perdita, in memory of a little girl born between them, who had lived but a few weeks. When Bernard Wingrave came to his sixteenth year, his mother put a brave face upon it and prepared to execute her husband's last injunction. This had been a formal command that, at the proper age, his son should be sent out to England to complete his education at the University of Oxford, where he himself had acquired his taste for elegant literature. It was Mrs. Wingrave's belief that the lad's equal was not to be found in the two hemispheres, but she had the old traditions of literal obedience. She swallowed her sobs and made up her boy's trunk and his simple provincial outfit and sent him on his way across the seas. Bernard presented himself at his father's college and spent five years in England, without great honour, indeed, but with a vast deal of pleasure and no discredit. On leaving the university he made the journey to France. In his twenty-fourth year he took ship for home, prepared to find poor little New England, New England was very small in those days, a very dull, unfashionable residence. But there had been changes at home, as well as in Mr. Bernard's opinions. He found his mother's house quite habitable, and his sisters grown into two very charming young ladies, with all the accomplishments and graces of the young women of Britain, and a certain native-grown originality and wildness, which, if it was not an accomplishment, was certainly a grace the more. Bernard privately assured his mother that his sisters were fully a match for the most genteel young women in the old country, whereupon poor Mrs. Wingrave, you may be sure, bade them hold up their heads. Such was Bernard's opinion, and such, in a tenfold higher degree, was the opinion of Mr. Arthur Lloyd. This gentleman was a college mate of Mr. Bernard, a young man of reputable family, of a good person and a handsome inheritance, which latter appurtenance he proposed to invest in trade in the flourishing colony. He and Bernard were sworn friends. They had crossed the ocean together, and the young American had lost no time in presenting him at his mother's house where he had made quite as good an impression as that which he had received, and of that which I have just given a hint. The two sisters were at this time in all the freshness of their youthful bloom, each wearing, of course, this natural brilliancy in the manner that became her best. They were equally dissimilar in appearance and character. Rosalind, the elder, now in her twenty-second year, was tall and white, with calm grey eyes and auburn tresses a very faint likeness to the Rosalind of Shakespeare's comedy, whom I imagine a brunette, if you will, but a slender, airy creature, full of the softest, quickest impulses. Miss Wingrave, with her slightly lymphatic fairness, her fine arms, her majestic height, her slow utterance, was not cut out for adventures. She would never have put on a man's jacket and hose, and indeed, being a very plump beauty, she may have had reasons apart from her natural dignity. Perdita, too, might very well have exchanged the sweet melancholy of her name against something more in consonance with her aspect and disposition, 
she had the cheek of a gypsy and the eye of an eager child, as well as the smallest waist and lightest foot in all the country of the Puritans. When you spoke to her, she never made you wait, as her handsome sister was wont to do, while she looked at you with a cold, fine eye, but gave you your choice of a dozen answers before you had uttered half your thought. The young girls were very glad to see their brother once more, but they found themselves quite able to spare part of their attention for their brother's friend. Among the young men, their friends and neighbors, the belle jeunesse of the colony, there were many excellent fellows, several devoted swains, and some two or three who enjoyed the reputation of universal charmers and conquerors. But the homebred arts and somewhat boisterous gallantry of these honest colonists were completely eclipsed by the good looks, the fine clothes, the punctilious courtesy, the perfect elegance, the immense information of Mr. Arthur Lloyd. He was in reality no paragon. He was a capable, honorable, civil youth, rich in pounds sterling, in his health and complacency, and his little capital of uninvested affections. But he was a gentleman. He had a handsome person. He had studied and traveled. He spoke French. He played on the flute. And he read verses aloud with very great taste. There were a dozen reasons why Miss Wingrave and her sister should have thought their other male acquaintance made but a poor figure before such a perfect man of the world. Mr. Lloyd's anecdotes told our little New England maidens a great deal more of the ways and means of people of fashion in European capitals than he had any idea of doing. It was delightful to sit by and hear him and Bernard talk about the fine people and fine things they had seen. They would all gather round the fire after tea, in the little wainscoted parlor, and the two young men would remind each other, across the rug, of this, that, and the other adventure. Rosalind and Perdita would often have given their ears to know exactly what adventure it was, and where it happened, and who was there, and what the ladies had on. But in those days a well-bred young woman was not expected to break into the conversation of her elders, or to ask too many questions, and the poor girls used therefore to sit fluttering behind the more languid, or more discreet curiosity of their mother. That they were both very fine girls, Arthur Lloyd was not slow to discover, but it took him some time to make up his mind whether he liked the big sister or the little sister best. He had a strong presentiment, an emotion of a nature entirely too cheerful to be called a foreboding, that he was destined to stand before the parson with one of them. Yet he was unable to arrive at a preference, and for such a consummation a preference was certainly necessary for Lloyd had too much young blood in his veins to make a choice by lot and be cheated of the satisfaction of falling in love. He resolved to take things as they came, to let his heart speak. Meanwhile, he was on a very pleasant footing. Mrs. Wingrave showed a dignified indifference to his intentions, equally remote from a carelessness of her daughter's honor and from that sharp alacrity to make him come to the point, which, in his quality of a young man of property, he had too often encountered in the worldly matrons of his native islands. As for Bernard, all that he asked was that his friend should treat his sisters as his own, and as for the poor girls themselves, however each may have secretly longed that their visitors should do or say something marked, they kept a very modest and contented demeanor. Towards each other, however, they were somewhat more on the offensive. They were good friends enough, and accommodating bedfellows. They shared the same four-poster, betwixt whom it would take more than a day for the seeds of jealousy to sprout and bear fruit, but they felt that the seeds had been sown on the day that Mr. Lloyd came into the house. Each made up her mind that, if she should be slighted, she would bear her grief in silence, and that no one should be any the wiser, for if they had a great deal of ambition, they had also a large share of pride. But each prayed in secret, nevertheless, that upon her the selection, the distinction, might fall. They had need of a vast deal of patience, of self-control, of dissimulation. In those days a young girl of decent breeding could make no advances whatever, and barely respond, indeed, to those that were made. She was expected to sit still in her chair, with her eyes on the carpet, watching the spot where the mystic handkerchief should fall. Poor Arthur Lloyd was obliged to carry on his wooing in the little wainscoted parlor, before the eyes of Mrs. Wingrave, her son, and his prospective sister-in-law. But youth and love are so cunning that a hundred signs and tokens might travel to and fro, and not one of these three pairs of eyes detect them in their passage. 
the two maidens were almost always together, and had plenty of chances to betray themselves. That each knew she was being watched, however, made not a grain of difference in the little offices they mutually rendered, or in the various household tasks they performed in common. Neither flinched nor fluttered beneath the silent battery of her sister's eyes. The only apparent change in their habits was that they had less to say to each other. It was impossible to talk about Mr. Lloyd, and it was ridiculous to talk about anything else. By tacit agreement, they began to wear all their choice finery, and to devise such little implements of conquest, in the way of ribbons and topknots and kerchiefs, as were sanctioned by indubitable modesty. They executed in the same inarticulate fashion a contract of fair play in this exciting game. Is it better so? Rosalind would ask, tying a bunch of ribbons on her bosom and turning about from her glass to her sister. Perdita would look up gravely from her work and examine the decoration. I think you had better give it another loop, she would say, with great solemnity, looking hard at her sister with eyes that added, Upon my honour! So they were forever stitching and trimming their petticoats, and pressing out their muslins, and contriving washes and ointments and cosmetics like the ladies in the household of the vicar of Wakefield. Some three or four months went by. It grew to be midwinter, and as yet, Rosalind knew that if Perdita had nothing more to boast of than she, there was not much to be feared from her rivalry. But Perdita, by this time, the charming Perdita, felt that her secret had grown to be tenfold more precious than her sister's. One afternoon, Miss Wingrave sat alone, that was a rare accident, before her toilet glass, combing out her long hair. It was getting too dark to see. She lit the two candles in their sockets on the frame of her mirror, and then went to the window to draw her curtains. It was a grey December evening. The landscape was bare and bleak, and the sky heavy with snow clouds. At the end of the large garden into which her window looked was a wall with a little postern door, opening into a lane. The door stood ajar, as she could vaguely see in the gathering darkness and moved slowly to and fro, as if someone were swaying it from the lane without. It was doubtless a servant-maid who had been having a tryst with her sweetheart. But as she was about to drop her curtain, Rosalind saw her sister step into the garden and hurry along the path which led to the house. She dropped the curtain, all save a little crevice for her eyes. As Perdita came up the path, she seemed to be examining something in her hand, holding it close to her eyes. When she reached the house, she stopped a moment, looked intently at the object, and pressed it to her lips. Poor Rosalind slowly came back to her chair and sat down before her glass, where, if she had looked at it less abstractedly, she would have seen her handsome features sadly disfigured by jealousy. A moment afterwards, the door opened behind her and her sister came into the room, out of breath, and her cheeks aglow with the chilly air. Perdita started. Ah! said she. I thought you were with our mother. The ladies were to go to a tea party, and on such occasions it was the habit of one of the young girls to help their mother to dress. Instead of coming in, Perdita lingered at the door. Come in, come in, said Rosalind. We have more than an hour yet. I should like you very much to give a few strokes to my hair. She knew that her sister wished to retreat, and that she could see in the glass all her movements in the room. Nay, just help me with my hair, she said, and I will go to Mama. Perdita came reluctantly and took the brush. She saw her sister's eyes in the glass, fastened hard upon her hands. She had not made three passes when Rosalind clapped her own right hand upon her sister's left and started out of her chair. Whose ring is that? she cried passionately, drawing her towards the light. On the young girl's third finger glistened a little gold ring, adorned with a very small sapphire. Perdita felt that she need no longer keep her secret, yet that she must put a bold face on her avowal. "'It's mine,' she said proudly. "'Who gave it to you?' cried the other. Perdita hesitated a moment. "'Mr. Lloyd.' "'Mr. Lloyd is generous all of a sudden.' "'Ah, no,' cried Perdita, with spirit. "'Not all of a sudden.' He offered it to me a month ago. And you needed a month's begging to take it, said Rosalind, looking at the little trinket, which indeed was not especially elegant, 
although it was the best that the jeweler of the province could furnish. I wouldn't have taken it in less than two. It isn't the ring, Perdita answered. It's what it means. It means you are not a modest girl, cried Rosalind. Pray, does your mother know of your intrigue? Does Bernard? My mother has approved my intrigue, as you call it. Mr. Lloyd has asked for my hand, and Mama has given it. Would you have had him apply to you, dearest sister? Rosalind gave her companion a long look, full of passionate envy and sorrow. Then she dropped her lashes on her pale cheeks and turned away. Perdita felt that it had not been a pretty scene, but it was her sister's fault. However, the elder girl rapidly called back her pride and turned herself about again. You have my very best wishes, she said with a low curtsy. I wish you every happiness and a very long life. Perdita gave a bitter laugh. Don't speak in that tone, she cried. I would rather you should curse me outright. Come, Rosie, she added. He couldn't marry both of us. I wish you very great joy, Rosalind repeated mechanically, sitting down to her glass again. And a very long life and plenty of children. There was something in the sound of these words not at all to Perdita's taste. Will you give me a year to live at least, she said. In a year I can have one little boy, or one little girl at least. If you will give me your brush again, I will do your hair. Thank you, said Rosalind. You had better go to Mama. It isn't becoming that a young lady with a promised husband should wait on a girl with none. Nay, said Perdita, good-humouredly, I have Arthur to wait upon me. You need my service more than I need yours. But her sister motioned her away, and she left the room. When she had gone, poor Rosalind fell on her knees before her dressing table, buried her head in her arms, and poured out a flood of tears and sobs. She felt very much the better for this effusion of sorrow. When her sister came back, she insisted upon helping her to dress, on her wearing her prettiest things. She forced upon her acceptance a bit of lace of her own, and declared that now that she was to be married, she should do her best to appear worthy of her lover's choice. She discharged these offices in stern silence, but such as they were, they had to do duty as an apology and an atonement. She never made any other. Now that Lloyd was received by the family as an accepted suitor, nothing remained but to fix the wedding day. It was appointed for the following April, and in the interval, preparations were diligently made for the marriage. Lloyd, on his side, was busy with his commercial arrangements, and with establishing a correspondence with the great mercantile house to which he had attached himself in England. He was therefore not so frequent a visitor at Mrs. Wingrave's as during the months of his diffidence and irresolution, and poor Rosalind had less to suffer than she had feared from the sight of the mutual endearments of the young lovers. Touching his future sister-in-law, Lloyd had a perfectly clear conscience. There had not been a particle of love-making between them, and he had not the slightest suspicion that he had dealt her a terrible blow. He was quite at his ease. Life promised so well, both domestically and financially. The great revolt of the colonies was not yet in the air, and that his connubial felicity should take a tragic turn, it was absurd, it was blasphemous to apprehend. Meanwhile, at Mrs. Wingrave's, there was a greater rustling of silks, a more rapid clicking of scissors, and flying of needles than ever. The good lady had determined that her daughter should carry from home the genteelest outfit that her money could buy, or that the country could furnish. All the sage women in the province were convened, and their united taste was brought to bear on Perdita's wardrobe. Rosalind's situation, at this moment, was assuredly not to be envied. The poor girl had an inordinate love of dress, and the very best taste in the world, as her sister perfectly well knew. Rosalind was tall, she was stately and sweeping, she was made to carry stiff brocade and masses of heavy lace, such as belonged to the toilet of a rich man's wife. But Rosalind sat aloof, with her beautiful arms folded and her head averted, while her mother and sister and the venerable women aforesaid worried and wondered over their materials oppressed by the multitude of their resources. One day there came in a beautiful piece of white silk, brocaded with heavenly blue and silver, sent by the bridegroom himself, 
it not being thought amiss in those days that the husband-elect should contribute to the bride's trousseau. Perdita could think of no form or fashion which would do sufficient honor to the splendor of the material. "'Blue's your color, sister, more than mine,' she said with appealing eyes. "'It's a pity it's not for you. You would know what to do with it.' Rosalind got up from her place and looked at the great shining fabric as it lay spread over the back of a chair. Then she took it up in her hands and felt it, lovingly, as Perdita could see, and turned about toward the mirror with it. She let it roll down to her feet and flung the other end over her shoulder, gathering it in about her waist with her white arm, which was bare to the elbow. She threw back her head and looked at her image, and a hanging tress of her auburn hair fell upon the gorgeous surface of the silk. It made a dazzling picture. The women standing about uttered a little, Look, look, of admiration. Yes, indeed, said Rosalind, quietly. Blue is my color. But Perdita could see that her fancy had been stirred, and that she would now fall to work and solve all their silken riddles. And indeed she behaved very well, as Perdita, knowing her insatiable love of millinery, was quite ready to declare. Innumerable yards of lustrous silk and satin, of muslin, velvet, and lace, passed through her cunning hands, without a jealous word coming from her lips. Thanks to her industry, when the wedding day came, Perdita was prepared to espouse more of the vanities of life than any fluttering young bride who had yet received the sacramental blessing of a New England divine. It had been arranged that the young couple should go out and spend the first days of their wedded life at the country house of an English gentleman, a man of rank and a very kind friend to Arthur Lloyd. He was a bachelor. He declared he should be delighted to give up the place to the influence of Hyman. After the ceremony at church, it had been performed by an English clergyman, young Mrs. Lloyd hastened back to her mother's house to change her nuptial robes for a riding dress. Rosalind helped her to effect the change in the little homely room in which they had spent their undivided younger years. Perdita then hurried off to bid farewell to her mother, leaving Rosalind to follow. The parting was short, the horses were at the door, and Arthur was impatient to start. But Rosalind had not followed, and Perdita hastened back to her room, opening the door abruptly. Rosalind, as usual, was before the glass, but in a position which caused the other to stand still, amazed. She had dressed herself in Perdita's cast-off wedding veil and wreath, and on her neck she had hung the full string of pearls which the young girl had received from her husband as a wedding gift. These things had been hastily laid aside to await their possessor's disposal on her return from the country. Bedizened in this unnatural garb, Rosalind stood before the mirror, plunging a long look into its depths and reading heaven knows what audacious visions. Perdita was horrified. It was a hideous image of their old rivalry come to life again. She made a step toward her sister, as if to pull off the veil and the flowers, but catching her eyes in the glass, she stopped. Farewell, sweetheart, she said. You might at least have waited till I had got out of the house, and she hurried away from the room. Mr. Lloyd had purchased in Boston a house, which to the taste of those days appeared as elegant as it was commodious, and here he very soon established himself with his young wife. He was thus separated by a distance of twenty miles from the residence of his mother-in-law. Twenty miles in that primitive era of roads and conveyances were as serious a matter as a hundred at the present day and Mrs. Wingrave saw but little of her daughter during the first twelve-month of her marriage. She suffered in no small degree from Perdita's absence, and her affliction was not diminished by the fact that Rosalind had fallen into terribly low spirits, and was not to be roused or cheered but by change of air and company. The real cause of the young lady's dejection the reader will not be slow to suspect. Mrs. Wingrave and her gossips, however, deemed her complaint a mere bodily ill and doubted not that she would obtain relief from the remedy just mentioned. Her mother accordingly proposed, on her behalf, a visit to certain relatives on the paternal side, established in New York, who had long complained that they were able to see so little of their New England cousins. Rosalind was dispatched to these good people, under a suitable escort, and remained with them for several months. In the interval, her brother Bernard, who had begun the practice of law, made up his mind to take a wife. Rosalind came home to the wedding, apparently cured of her heartache, 
with bright roses and lilies in her face and a proud smile on her lips. Arthur Lloyd came over from Boston to see his brother-in-law married, but without his wife, who was expecting very soon to present him with an heir. It was nearly a year since Rosalind had seen him. She was glad, she hardly knew why, that Perdita had stayed at home. Arthur looked happy, but he was more grave and important than before his marriage. She thought he looked interesting, for although the word, in its modern sense, was not then invented, we may be sure that the idea was. The truth is, he was simply anxious about his wife and her coming ordeal. Nevertheless, he by no means failed to observe Rosalind's beauty and splendor, and to note how she effaced the poor little bride. The allowance that Perdita had enjoyed for her dress had now been transferred to her sister, who turned it to wonderful account. On the morning after the wedding, he had a lady's saddle put on the horse of the servant who had come with him from town, and went out with the young girl for a ride. It was a keen, clear morning in January. The ground was bare and hard, and the horses in good condition, to say nothing of Rosalind, who was charming in her hat and plume, and her dark blue riding coat, trimmed with fur. They rode all the morning, they lost their way, and were obliged to stop for dinner at a farmhouse. The early winter dusk had fallen when they got home. Mrs. Wingrave met them with a long face. A messenger had arrived at noon from Mrs. Lloyd. She was beginning to be ill. She desired her husband's immediate return. The young man, at the thought that he had lost several hours, and that by hard riding he might already have been with his wife, uttered a passionate oath. He barely consented to stop for a mouthful of supper, but mounted the messenger's horse and started off at a gallop. He reached home at midnight. His wife had been delivered of a little girl. Ah, why weren't you with me? she said as he came to her bedside. I was out of the house when the man came. I was with Rosalind, said Lloyd innocently. Mrs. Lloyd made a little moan and turned away. But she continued to do very well, and for a week her improvement was uninterrupted. Finally, however, through some indiscretion in the way of diet or exposure, it was checked, and the poor lady grew rapidly worse. Lloyd was in despair. It very soon became evident that she was breathing her last. Mrs. Lloyd came to a sense of her approaching end, and declared that she was reconciled with death. On the third evening after the change took place, she told her husband that she felt she should not get through the night. She dismissed her servants, and also requested her mother to withdraw, Mrs. Wingrave having arrived on the preceding day. She had had her infant placed on the bed beside her, and she lay on her side, with the child against her breast holding her husband's hands. The night lamp was hidden behind the heavy curtains of the bed, but the room was illumined with a red glow from the immense fire of logs on the hearth. It seems strange not to be warmed into life by such a fire as that, the young woman said, feebly trying to smile. If I had but a little of it in my veins. But I have given all my fire to this little spark of mortality. And she dropped her eyes on her child. Then raising them, she looked at her husband with a long, penetrating gaze. The last feeling which lingered in her heart was one of suspicion. She had not recovered from the shock which Arthur had given her by telling her that in the hour of her agony he had been with Rosalind. She trusted her husband very nearly as well as she loved him, but now that she was called away forever she felt a cold horror of her sister. She felt in her soul that Rosalind had never ceased to be jealous of her good fortune and a year of happy security had not effaced the young girl's image, dressed in her wedding garments and smiling with simulated triumph. Now that Arthur was to be alone, what might not Rosalind attempt? She was beautiful. She was engaging. What arts might she not use? What impression might she not make upon the young man's saddened heart? Mrs. Lloyd looked at her husband in silence. It seemed hard, after all, to doubt of his constancy. His fine eyes were filled with tears. His face was convulsed with weeping. The clasp of his hands was warm and passionate. How noble he looked! How tender! How faithful and devoted! Nay, thought Perdita, he's not for such a one as Rosalind. He'll never forget me. Nor does Rosalind truly care for him. She cares only for vanities and finery and jewels, 
and she lowered her eyes on her white hands, which her husband's liberality had covered with rings, and on the lace ruffles which trimmed the edge of her nightdress. She covets my rings and my laces more than she covets my husband. At this moment, the thought of her sister's rapacity seemed to cast a dark shadow between her and the helpless figure of her little girl. Arthur, she said, you must take off my rings. I shall not be buried in them. One of these days my daughter shall wear them, my rings and my laces and silks. I had them all brought out and shown me today. It's a great wardrobe. There's not such another in the province. I can say it without vanity, now that I have done with it. It will be a great inheritance for my daughter when she grows into a young woman. There are things there that a man never buys twice, and if they are lost, you will never again see the like. So you will watch them well. Some dozen things I have left to Rosalind. I have named them to my mother. I have given her that blue and silver. It was meant for her. I wore it only once. I looked ill in it. But the rest are to be sacredly kept for this little innocent. It's such a providence that she should be my color. She can wear my gowns. She has her mother's eyes. You know the same fashions come back every twenty years. She can wear my gowns as they are. They will lie there quietly waiting till she grows into them, wrapped in camphor and rose leaves, and keeping their colors in the sweet-scented darkness. She shall have black hair. She shall wear my carnation satin. Do you promise me, Arthur? Promise you what, dearest? Promise me to keep your poor little wife's old gowns. Are you afraid I shall sell them? No, but that they may get scattered. My mother will have them properly wrapped up, and you shall lay them away under a double lock. Do you know the great chest in the attic with the iron bands? There is no end to what it will hold. You can put them all there. My mother and the housekeeper will do it and give you the key. You will keep the key in your secretary and never give it to anyone but your child. Do you promise me? Uh, yes, I promise you, said Lloyd, puzzled at the intensity with which his wife appeared to cling to this idea. Will you swear? repeated Perdita. Yes, I swear. Well, I trust you. I trust you, said the poor lady, looking into his eyes with eyes in which, if he had suspected her vague apprehensions, he might have read an appeal quite as much as an assurance. Lloyd bore his bereavement rationally and manfully. A month after his wife's death, in the course of business, circumstances arose which offered him an opportunity of going to England. He took advantage of it to change the current of his thoughts. He was absent nearly a year, during which his little girl was tenderly nursed and guarded by her grandmother. On his return, he had his house again thrown open, and announced his intention of keeping the same state as during his wife's lifetime. It very soon came to be predicted that he would marry again, and there were at least a dozen young women of whom one may say that it was by no fault of theirs that, for six months after his return, the prediction did not come true. During this interval, he still left his little daughter in Mrs. Wingrave's hands, the latter assuring him that a change of residence at so tender an age would be full of danger for her health. Finally, however, he declared that his heart longed for his daughter's presence, and that she must be brought up to town. He sent his coach and his housekeeper to fetch her home. Mrs. Wingrave was in terror lest something should befall her on the road, and, in accordance with this feeling, Rosalind offered to accompany her she could return the next day. So she went up to town with her little niece, and Mr. Lloyd met her on the threshold of his house, overcome with her kindness and with paternal joy. Instead of returning the next day, Rosalind stayed out the week, and when at last she reappeared, she had only come for her clothes. Arthur would not hear of her coming home, nor would the baby. That little person cried and choked if Rosalind left her and at the sight of her grief Arthur lost his wits and swore that she was going to die. In fine, nothing would suit them but that the aunt should remain until the little niece had grown used to strange faces. It took two months to bring this consummation about, for it was not until this period had elapsed that Rosalind took leave of her brother-in-law. Mrs. Wingrave had shaken her head over her daughter's absence. She had declared that it was not becoming 
that it was the talk of the whole country. She had reconciled herself to it only because, during the girl's visit, the household enjoyed an unwanted term of peace. Bernard Wingrave had brought his wife home to live, between whom and her sister-in-law there was as little love as you please. Rosalind was perhaps no angel, but in the daily practice of life she was a sufficiently good-natured girl, and if she quarrelled with Mrs. Bernard, it was not without provocation. Quarrel, however, she did, to the great annoyance not only of her antagonist, but of the two spectators of these constant altercations. Her stay in the household of her brother-in-law, therefore, would have been delightful, if only because it removed her from contact with the object of her antipathy at home. It was doubly, it was ten times delightful, in that it kept her near the object of her early passion. Mrs. Lloyd's sharp suspicions had fallen very far short of the truth. Rosalind's sentiment had been a passion at first, and a passion it remained, a passion whose radiant heat, tempered to the delicate state of his feelings, Mr. Lloyd very soon felt the influence. Lloyd, as I have hinted, was not a modern Petrarch. It was not in his nature to practice an ideal constancy. He had not been many days in the house with his sister-in-law before he began to assure himself that she was, in the language of that day, a devilish fine woman. Whether Rosalind really practiced those insidious arts that her sister had been tempted to impute to her, it is needless to inquire. It is enough to say that she found means to appear to the very best advantage. She used to seat herself every morning before the big fireplace in the dining room, at work upon a piece of tapestry, with her little niece disporting herself on the carpet at her feet, or on the train of her dress, and playing with her woolen balls. Lloyd would have been a very stupid fellow if he had remained insensible to the rich suggestions of this charming picture. He was exceedingly fond of his little girl, and was never weary of taking her in his arms and tossing her up and down, and making her crow with delight. Very often, however, he would venture upon greater liberties than the young lady was yet prepared to allow, and then she would suddenly vociferate her displeasure. Rosalind, at this, would drop her tapestry, and put out her handsome hands, with the serious smile of the young girl whose virgin fancy had revealed to her all a mother's healing arts. Lloyd would give up the child, their eyes would meet, their hands would touch, and Rosalind would extinguish the little girl's sobs upon the snowy folds of the kerchief that crossed her bosom. Her dignity was perfect, and nothing could be more discreet than the manner in which she accepted her brother-in-law's hospitality. It may almost be said, perhaps, that there was something harsh in her reserve. Lloyd had a provoking feeling that she was in the house and yet unapproachable. Half an hour after supper, at the very outset of the long winter evenings, she would light her candle, make the young man a most respectful curtsy, and march off to bed. If these were arts, Rosalind was a great artist. But their effect was so gentle, so gradual, they were calculated to work upon the young widower's fancy with a crescendo so finely shaded that, as the reader has seen, several weeks elapsed before Rosalind began to feel sure that her returns would cover her outlay. When this became morally certain, she packed up her trunk and returned to her mother's house. For three days she waited. On the fourth, Mr. Lloyd made his appearance, a respectful but pressing suitor. Rosalind heard him to the end with great humility, and accepted him with infinite modesty. It is hard to imagine that Mrs. Lloyd would have forgiven her husband, but if anything might have disarmed her resentment, it would have been the ceremonious continence of this interview. Rosalind imposed upon her lover but a short probation. They were married, as was becoming, with great privacy, almost with secrecy, in the hope, perhaps, as was waggishly remarked at the time, that the late Mrs. Lloyd wouldn't hear of it. The marriage was to all appearance a happy one, and each party obtained what each had desired. Lloyd, a devilish fine woman, and Rosalind, but Rosalind's desires, as the reader will have observed, had remained a good deal of a mystery. There were, indeed, two blots upon their felicity, but time would perhaps efface them. During the first three years of her marriage, Mrs. Lloyd failed to become a mother, and her husband, on his side, suffered heavy losses of money. This latter circumstance compelled a material retrenchment in his expenditure, and Rosalind was perforce less of a fine lady than her sister had been. She contrived, however, to carry it like a woman of considerable fashion. 
she had long since ascertained that her sister's copious wardrobe had been sequestrated for the benefit of her daughter, and that it lay languishing in thankless gloom in the dusty attic. It was a revolting thought that these exquisite fabrics should await the good pleasure of a little girl who sat in a high chair and ate bread and milk with a wooden spoon. Rosalind had the good taste, however, to say nothing about the matter until several months had expired. Then, at last, she timidly broached it to her husband. Was it not a pity that so much finery should be lost? For lost it would be, what with colors fading, and moths eating it up, and the change of fashions. But Lloyd gave her so abrupt and peremptory a refusal that she saw, for the present, her attempt was vain. Six months went by, however, and brought with them new needs and new visions. Rosalind's thoughts hovered lovingly about her sister's relics. She went up and looked at the chest in which they lay imprisoned. There was a sullen defiance in its three great padlocks and its iron bands, which only quickened her cupidity. There was something exasperating in its incorruptible immobility. It was like a grim and grizzled old household servant who locks his jaws over a family secret. And then there was a look of capacity in its vast extent, and a sound as of dense fullness, when Rosalind knocked its side with the toe of her little shoe, which caused her to flush with baffled longing. It's absurd, she cried. It's improper. It's wicked. And she forthwith resolved upon another attack upon her husband. On the following day, after dinner, when he had had his wine, she boldly began it. But he cut her short with great sternness. Once and for all, Rosalind, said he, it's out of the question. I shall be gravely displeased if you return to the matter. Very good, said Rosalind. I am glad to learn the esteem in which I am held. Gracious heaven, she cried, I am a very happy woman. It's an agreeable thing to feel oneself sacrificed to a caprice. And her eyes filled with tears of anger and disappointment. Lloyd had a good-natured man's horror of a woman's sobs, and he attempted, I may say he condescended, to explain. It's not a caprice, dear, it's a promise, he said. An oath. An oath? It's a pretty matter for oaths. And to whom, pray? To Perdita, said the young man, raising his eyes for an instant, but immediately dropping them. Perdita! Ah, Perdita! and Rosalind's tears broke forth. Her bosom heaved with stormy sobs, sobs which were the long-deferred sequel of the violent fit of weeping in which she had indulged herself on the night when she discovered her sister's betrothal. She had hoped, in her better moments, that she had done with her jealousy, but her temper, on that occasion, had taken an ineffaceable fold. "'And pray, what right had Perdita to dispose of my future?' she cried. What right had she to bind you to meanness and cruelty? Ah, I occupy a dignified place, and I make a very fine figure. I am welcome to what Perdita has left. And what has she left? I never knew till now how little. Nothing, nothing, nothing. This was very poor logic, but it was very good as a scene. Lloyd put his arm around his wife's waist and tried to kiss her, but she shook him off with magnificent scorn. Poor fellow! He had coveted a devilish fine woman, and he had got one. Her scorn was intolerable. He walked away with his ears tingling, irresolute, distracted. Before him was his secretary, and in it the sacred key which with his own hand he had turned in the triple lock. He marched up and opened it, and took the key from a secret drawer, wrapped in a little packet which he had sealed with his own honest bit of blazonry. Je garde, said the motto. I keep. But he was ashamed to put it back. He flung it upon the table beside his wife. Put it back, she cried. I want it not. I hate it. I wash my hands of it, cried her husband. God forgive me. Mrs. Lloyd gave an indignant shrug of her shoulders and swept out of the room, while the young man retreated by another door. Ten minutes later, Mrs. Lloyd returned and found the room occupied by her little stepdaughter and the nursery maid. The key was not on the table. She glanced at the child. Her little niece was perched on a chair with the packet in her hands. She had broken the seal with her own small fingers. Mrs. Lloyd hastily took possession of the key 
At the habitual supper hour, Arthur Lloyd came back from his counting room. It was the month of June, and supper was served by daylight. The meal was placed on the table, but Mrs. Lloyd failed to make her appearance. The servant, whom his master sent to call on her, came back with the assurance that her room was empty, and that the women informed him that she had not been seen since dinner. They had, in truth, observed her to have been in tears, and, supposing her to be shut up in her chamber, had not disturbed her. Her husband called her name in various parts of the house, but without response. At last, it occurred to him that he might find her by taking the way to the attic. The thought gave him a strange feeling of discomfort, and he bade his servants remain behind, wishing no witness in his quest. He reached the foot of the staircase leading to the topmost flat, and stood with his hand on the banisters, pronouncing his wife's name. His voice trembled. He called again louder and more firmly. The only sound which disturbed the absolute silence was a faint echo of his own tones, repeating his question under the great eaves. He nevertheless felt irresistibly moved to ascend the staircase. It opened upon a wide hall, lined with wooden closets, and terminating in a window which looked westward, and admitted the last rays of the sun. Before the window stood the great chest. Before the chest, on her knees, the young man saw with amazement and horror the figure of his wife. In an instant he crossed the interval between them, bereft of utterance. The lid of the chest stood open, exposing, amid their perfumed napkins, its treasure of stuffs and jewels. Rosalind had fallen backward from a kneeling posture, with one hand supporting her on the floor and the other pressed to her heart. On her limbs was the stiffness of death, and on her face, in the fading light of the sun, the terror of something more than death. Her lips were parted in entreaty, in dismay, in agony, and on her blanched brow and cheeks there glowed the marks of ten hideous wounds from two vengeful, ghostly hands. Thank you for listening to this Coffin Road production of The Romance of Certain Old Clothes by Henry James Read and produced by Ryan Marshall Theme music by Andrei Sitkov Photography by Rebe Pasqual The full catalogue of Coffin Road audiobook releases is available at coffinroad.bandcamp.com Thank you once again for listening to Coffin Road <laughs>